You're listening to All Marine Radio on the All Warrior Radio Network. Next thing I'd like to uh, talk about is uh, command and control a little bit. And I think uh, this is where we get maybe into the biggest trouble. The, the commander, I, I tell my headquarters company guys, get them out, that they're, they're really critical. That my ability to command is directly dependent upon their ability to perform their mission. And the comp platoon, the guys that support us, everybody else. And, and it's, it's key, I think I spend more time on this particular subject, command and control, than anything else. I try to make it a very dynamic thing. My headquarters commandant, my three, my combo, have constantly have got to be innovating. They constantly have to come up with new things or new ideas or I get pissed at them. And they are. We're ever screw, forever screwing around with the SOP, with the facilities, with the procedures, always seeking to streamline them, make them more effective, everything else. And we learn from every CPX, every map exercise, everything we do. In two years, I told you we deployed or went on a major exercise 10 times. We went on 20 CPXs, probably did about 30 map exercises. Every week I require my headquarters company to do what I call command post training. And it's to make sure that they really keep these things unlimbered. The first thing you have to do as a commander is to create the right environment. Now you see, I got this philosophy that we like Garrison. Garrison closely simulates where we're from back in East Cupcake. So we're used to lights and showers. We're used to racks with linen and all these things. The abnormal thing is the field. We go there, but we don't like it. I mean, we say we do because we're Marines, but we try to gut it out. We don't do wrong things in the field. I mean, I got guys that go to the field to pride themselves that they don't take a crap in the time they're out there. You know, I, you gotta make them do that kind of stuff. I mean, it, they change their whole routine when they go to the field. They're not used to it. The environment's gotta be one of being expeditionary, of being light, of being active, of being oriented and comfortable in the environment out there. The environment you create has to be one like that. My office in the 9th Marines didn't have shit in it. There wasn't a plaque on the wall. There wasn't a goddamn plant in there or any of that other crap. I mean, the only good thing there for is to carry your helmet. But I don't, if you have one, you shouldn't have one. You know, but I don't like any of that. You know, I just got a desk. I got a rule that I don't put anything in the drawers of the desk. Because then it's like you want to stay there. Stuff, I don't read anything. I will go to General Caulfield now. <laughs> As a seal resident, I didn't read anything, just sign it. Matter of fact, I, I took two weeks leave before I come over here back in 9th Marines, and I was going after change of command, and a sergeant major came up to me and he says, Sir, you gotta talk to this new guy. He says, remember how you sign everything, even a blank piece of paper if we put it in front of you? This guy reads the stuff now. And then I felt kind of bad about it. But I just signed it. If it's screwed up, I'll kill you. You know, that's a good They understand that. And that's trust. It's part of maneuver warfare, you know? That's trust. You give me the right thing, I say. I don't spend any time in the office. You get the hell out. Now, how does this relate to command and control? You create the idea that you're going to go to the field, that you want to be in the field, and they're going to be light in the field. I, I destroyed, put away, hid. There is not a cot in the 9th Marine Regiment. No one is ever allowed to sleep on a cot. Matter of fact, when General Van Riper was the Chief of Staff, 3rd Marine Division, no one in the division was allowed to have a cot, ever, anywhere. There are no cots. I don't have a tent. I have never slept under a tent in two years in the 9th Marine Division. I sleep underneath my vehicle. I sleep if we're, on, if we're foot mobile CP mode on the deck next to PFC so-and-so, you know, get crap in the cat hole next to the PFC and, and shoot the shit literally about the weather. You know, that's the way your life has got to be as a regimental commander. I grew up in a Marine Corps, it wasn't like that. Tent City. I mean, if you went to a regimental CP, you wanted to call Barnum and Bailey in to be able to tell him that maybe you could move this with your elephant train. And battalions were just as bad. Thank God we're changing all that. You've got to be light. And where you pay for streamlining and going light are in these creature copter items. I got a rule. We displace at a minimum every 24 hours. I never spend the same night in the same place unless I can help it. 
I spent two nights in some places, not because I wanted to, because I got forced into it. But I like to, to, to uh, get the hell out and, and, and to move and not spend any time that I have to. Mobility is security for command and control facilities. You've got to move. That's critical. And you've got to be, you've got to pay the price in streamlining in these creature comforts so you can afford to put it into other things that are more important on the battlefield. You can't go so austere that you can't do the job. And you can't forget, if you're a regiment or a battalion, speaking from that perspective, that you don't go to war as a regiment or a battalion. You go to war as a reinforced regiment or an RLT. Other people come. You see, I've seen regiments that say, this is the COC. We developed it on the parade deck, and it's got all my guys. And I go in and I say, when you get back, or when you get engineers, or when you get you know other attachments, direct support, where do they go? Oh, out there somewhere in the dark, you know? They're never integrated into the system. It can't be that way. Now, how you set up the facility is important. Now, I gotta tell you a little bit about it. Now, I wanna go back to the sensing of the battlefield, the way I gotta do it. My eyes, if they're not on the fight physically, I'm forward, they got to be on the S2's map. Now, my S2 is the key man in my organization. First of all, there's no such thing as an Alpha and Bravo command group below the division level. That's bullshit. You know, you can't do it. You don't have the gear of the people. You can do it for a week and fake it, just like you don't have to take a crap for a week and you know, and fake it. But you can't exist in two mirror image CPs. I don't give a shit who you are. You can't do it, not in the long term. You have a CP. You can take the command group out of that CP temporarily, and you can go forward with it, you can operate, you can control with it, but that's different from two mirror image CPs. I operate with a command group that generally stays out forward. I come in occasionally for a lot of different reasons, change, change over radio operators, give people a break, get briefed up. I might pass control back on my way or whatever. You know, I might take it and move out, but there's this constant flow in and out of the command group from that CP. My sensing of everything has to be eyes on the two map. My hearing is the tactics, higher and lower. Nothing else I, do I want to hear. Nothing else is allowed to be on a speaker if anything's on a speaker. But I listen to the two next. You know, that's how, that's what I want to hear. My fire support coordinator, my ALO, quietly come up and mention that there are uh, calls for fire or there are things to be arbitrated, at least at my level. When I was a battalion commander, it might have been calls for fire, at my level, that, that he may pick up on calls for fire, or he may pick up on things that two units need some sort of arbitration on. But he's informing me from that point of view. The intel officer tells me of things that are happening that he's picking up, because he has a lot of eyes and ears out there. I described that one thing we did in the force on force with the LAI battalion, bouncing off one and then going deep. I never talked to the LAI battalion directly through that whole thing. One time after the deception, he swung by my CP on the way out. I never doubted where he was or what he was doing. Without talking to him, we had communications. First of all, he's a good friend of mine. I know him. We think alike. And I knew what he was up to. How did I know where he was and what he was, what he was doing? Recon teams reported him. You know, I actually had recon teams out that saw him and reported him, which they were supposed to do. I had pre-planned logistic support that was taken out to them by helicopter aviation drops. They reported. You know, I had other things that flew over, airstrikes and things that went on, that reported, cited. That's a form of communications. Knowledge is a form of communications to what he's doing. We have the rule of critical calm. I used to call it desperate calm, but I didn't like it because it sounded too, you know, too heavy. So I went to critical calm. And critical communication means I only need to talk to you if it's something that affects the intent. Something means that I ought to change the intent, you can't accomplish or carry out my intent, the enemy, the terrain, or something else is going to do something to affect the intent, then we need to talk. How we get to talk? Million and one different ways. And we can figure it out. When I was a battalion commander, I controlled all pyrotechnics that went into the air. They all meant something. Company commanders could have the shit that goes on the ground. But I controlled the meaning of everything that went into the air. The form of communications. It had meaning. I'm in the attack. I've secured the objective. You know, so by a series of pyro, one company could understand what another's doing. I'm a believer not in vertical communications, but in lateral communications. I want two battalion commanders to talk to each other through an attack 
rather than me directing them through an attack and they're coming up and I'm going down, coming up and going down. See, battalion commanders come to me and say, okay, now I know you got so-and-so on the right and left, what do you want me to do, what do you want, what do you want him to do? Go talk to him, decide what you want to do. You know, you guys talk it out. I'm going to talk a little bit about control measures and a little bit and how I handle that, how that kind of works in this context too. But they've got to work it out. Do the lateral communications. I'll monitor, listen, or whatever. I'm not worried about it. I don't need to talk to you. We have these bullshit reports you got to get rid of. Somebody comes up and tells you, you got a battalion in the attack. Boom, he makes contact with a squad. You know, he takes a couple of casualties, calls in a medevac, he kills a couple of guys. I get a report saying, I made contact and killed three guys. Well, no shit. That's what you were supposed to do. Why do I need a report? Why do I need position reports? During the force on force, there was a point in time, and I mentioned this to some of you, when I leaned over to my tree, or he leaned over to me, and we were studying the, the two map intently, because we were trying to figure out where 4th Marines was and how he was lining up. We were, and I hate to use this term, we were sort of templating it, you know? Because you know why? IPB works against us. We're so predictable. So I was IPBing him because I knew how he was going to operate. It was falling into place. You know, so I was doing my own intelligence preparation. We had gotten one battalion, we had gotten the CP, and we were getting the other battalion. It was starting to fall in. It was midnight. Lieutenant Colonel John Rosewarm, my three, turned to me and says, you know what, Colonel? Right now, and Glenn Preston was my fire support coordinator, who was here, was there next to me. He says, you know, right now, we know more about the exact position of the enemy than we do of our own position. And we kind of all chuckled, you know, around Glenn's coffee pot and said, that's right. Then we tried to figure out if that was wrong. That's got to be wrong. That's unmarine logic. We know more about the enemy than ourselves. So we talked about that for a while. We said, that's okay. We're not doing I don't need to know where everybody is. They're doing their thing. They're happy. They're going for it. I know where the bad guys are. I mean, life's good. Don't worry. Be happy. And, I, and, and, and we decided on that. And it was okay. You know, so, so you have to really structure your command and control and your sensing all these things to, to pick that all up. I generally like to stay away from, uh, it's not benign neglect, but I, you know, let's say my, my mobile CP mode is, 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 is four vehicles. Uh, and sometimes more if you have security and other things. But we're pretty light, we got away, we back them all up, throw canvas over like everybody else does, and we go through the drills to make it speedy. But I kind of try to stay away from that, the, 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 the internal part there. I go in and check on it, and I go forward a lot, do a lot of other things, but I tend not to get in there and insert myself on top of the uh, watch officer and on top of the three and the two. My three really knew me. He knew when I needed to be there, and he called me in, and he knew when, what to tell me. But I'll tell you what, you can get too close to the problem. You can get too involved, too caught up in the day-to-day -day and, and, and the minute-to-minute. -minute. You can get so wrapped into the COC that you burn yourself out. I have an obligation to keep myself fresh, and I do that. I stay out, and I rest, and I catnap, and I screw off. So when they need to dust me off, we got we call my friends the l Cid. Uh, syndrome. I keep telling them that really I'm dead. The they do is they dress me up in the armor and they parade me out when it's necessary. But really the three and the two of those guys went land the regiment and they would just dust, dust me off and they would say that, go get El Cid, bring him in, dust him off, dress him up, make the decision, we'll put him away again. Bomb him, put him away. You know? But I think that's what the commander's for. And I don't think a commander that kind of runs himself into the deck and gets involved in the nitloid shit is going to make it. And you can't do that, you know, and that's kind of the environment that, that you have to set up. I want to talk a little bit about control measures, organization of the battlefield, battlefield geometry, which we love. Because you see, I was probably a distinguished grad at AWS because I knew how many lines to invent the op water, and I knew how to draw, and I could do the symbology way before your time, but so you're all good. You know, and matter of fact, the guy who was a general with me then, he made, he made the flag, so... Uh, we would have revert back to that process. But, you know, I learned to be a draftsman, you know, really a perfect guy and how to draw the battlefield. I drew the battlefield. I actually began to believe at one time in my life that the battlefield really was the graphics that I drew. People believe that now. 
Show me a main attack. What does the guy show you? He shows you this. There's the objective, there's the axis of advance, and they give them a zone of action, you know, and that's the main attack. A graphic portrayal is some shit that doesn't mean anything to you. I hate control measures. Control measures are weaknesses. Every control measure you put down is a self-imposed weakness. A boundary is a weakness. A boundary is a scene. When you put a boundary down, you put a scene down. I learned from the VC, the guys try to probe for your boundaries, find them, and attack along them. Why? Because we stay away from boundaries. If you get close to the sucker, you gotta coordinate with that son of a bitch next to you. I don't wanna have to do that. Stay away a little bit. Where do we put them? Known terrain features, recognizable terrain features, streams, roads, inclusive or exclusive, if you've been to basic school and you can add that term, you know, you know, bridge lines. And these are our boundaries. We begin the box and we create scenes, stitches, attack the scenes. I think the Israeli 73 war, right? Between the second and third Egyptian armies, bound the boundaries, big gap, blew right through, you know, north of the Great Bitter Lake. A scene. I don't use boundaries. Now, I gotta tell you the honest truth. The little suckers slip them in on me and they don't think I know it. Right, Glenn? I mean, I know the battalion commanders get all nervous and they create a bound, they have an agreement between each other. And they'll tell the fire sport coordinator so he won't kill me. But you know, I don't like it. And they always say to me, sir, how can you operate without a boundary? You gotta have a boundary. I say boundary causes vertical thinking. Boundaries mean, okay, because the colonel drew a line, my right flank is secure. So now think forward and talk to the colonel and go. But don't talk to the other battalion or the other company. There's no need because there's a boundary. Hoping that the guy out there on the other team understands that rule that we've just established by the Marcus of Queensburg. Don't screw with me, I got a boundary here. I'm protected. You know what happens when you have no boundary? They gotta talk to each other. They hate it. They gotta cooperate, coordinate, and they don't like it. And I love it, because it's less work for me. Now it's the lateral communication, none of this vertical shit up and down. So I don't like boundaries. I don't like too many fire sport control measures either. I got something I wanna offer all you school uh, presidents, deans, or whatever you are. When you get the new class here, one of your test questions, ask, take the, now we have two types of fire sport control measures. Permissive and restrictive, right? Did I say that right? You already got it. All right. Now, let's take one of those permissive suckers. Coordinated fire line, right? CFL. We all know, because we're graduates here, that that's a permissive measure, that that means you don't have to coordinate the shit if you shoot, you know, surface indirect fires beyond it, right? Ask all the new guys what a coordinated fire line is. You know what they'll tell you in most cases? A coordinated fire line is something you have out there that if you shoot short of it, you gotta call a guy up and coordinate with him to talk to him. In other words, they put it in restrictive terms. Same with the fire support control measure. They put it out there to protect themselves. It's another, it's another scene. It's another protective measure. It's another thing out there that, that, that they put in. Run a map exercise or CPX with no boundaries and no fire support control measures. Try it. No objectives. Clean maps. I mean, you're going to cause some high anxiety at the beginning. But watch what happens after you do it. It's amazing how much communication, cooperation, coordination increases and how effective you become. You know, I, do, I defy you to do it. I've done it. They hate it. In the end, they love it. They're proud of it. We did this with no boundaries. A regiment with no boundaries. The last time, five maneuver elements. No boundaries. I know sometimes they stuck it in, they got, they got a little worried, nervous, and the three made a deal, cut a deal with the Italian commanders, they didn't tell them, don't tell El Cid, got a fucking boundary. <laughs> but I'll buy that, you know, there are times when they're going to force me into that stuff. But try it sometime. Get away from the battlefield geometry. And don't ever, if you're a commander, look at the threes map. It's the world according to Gart. It's not the way it really is. I want to talk about another trap we run into, phasing. As soon as we get into an operation, it's the first time, the first thing we do. Phase line red, phase line blue, phase line Sally, phase line Mary, you know, all phase line Ohio, we line them up. Phase one, phase two, phase three. Phases of offensive combat. Phases, phases, phases. 
We phase ourselves to death. They have no meaning. We have some natural phases, day to night, night to death. We change everything. It's getting dark, stop. Stand two, stand down. You know? We change names of things at night. I was on a final coordination line at the basic school. It got dark, I was on a probable line of deployment. I'm on the same little piece of terrain on a golf course. You suffer to change your name because it got dark. When it gets light, you want to change it back again. You know, ah, I don't understand. And when it gets dark, we do things differently. Release points, you know, guides, all this shit. We're going through this stuff. You know, and, and, and when we when we change from night to day, we phase. We eat three times a day or two. Basically, can I can tell when Americans eat. But I generally eat in the morning or sometimes late in the evening. We're going to have a third meal be around noon time, right? Now think about this if you're the enemy. I have phases of offensive combat. Phases lead to expectations. When I describe that sequence I went through at basic school, where I went from the assembly area to the objective. Now, you're a Lance Corporal of the United States Marine Corps rifle. You have just reached the objective. You have gone into the third phase of offensive combat. When I was a, a lieutenant, it was base. Movement to contact, the attack, consolidation, then exploitation. Now I guess it's pack, right? Preparation for the attack, the attack, consolidation, exploitation. Is that the new one? Or you guys, it's like sort of like Mount Mobile combat in a built up area, fighting in tall buildings. I don't know where to go. <laughs> but we change the name every once in a while to, to, to get it up, I guess. To, but, but we have a phase. Now that last corporal has got an expectation. What do you think it is? once he parks his butt on that hill that was the objective, and he's pursuing by fire, spray and pray. <laughs> what do you think the expectation is for that last court? The expectation is, it ain't going to have to get up and go forward. It's rest time. It's gunny with the chow. It ain't gunny with the chow in real combat. We don't, the, the bad guy doesn't give us this phase. It's a trap. You know, the, the sustainment routine can become a problem. The tactical phasing that I just described can become a problem. It leads to expectations. It leads to predictability. Get away from these phases. What a phase truly is, when you don't have a clear picture as to how to get to the center of gravity, when you don't have a clear picture how to fully carry out your intent, you've expressed it, and you're going to get to it, but it is in your mind, in time and space, a ways away. You got a clear picture of the immediate. Then you phase. Phase one is my clear picture. In my clear picture, my first time ashore period, I will get a clear picture of phase two. It's a clearing, evolving picture. I'll give you an example. Let's say I'm going to land. This is a port down here. I'm going to land up here on this beach, come down, and grab this port. There's some bad guys down here. Now, I'm a pretty good distance away. This bad guy is putting pressure on this port. His other bad guys are strung out in this direction. I'm landing behind him. And I look at this situation and say, you know, it's this line of communication that's critical. Center of gravity. He can be reinforced, he can withdraw. He wants to maintain that. If I pressure threaten, if in time and space I affect this thing, that's what's going to cause him to take the pressure off this, either move back or have to face and deal with this. But from up here at sea in my little boat, that is way far away. I know what I want to be and what I want to do. The when and, 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 and is, is, is now not clear. Phase one might be the establishment of that force beachhead line, getting ashore getting on limber, getting out to where I'm balanced and, and, and I'm prepared to move south. That's phase one. From that phase one, I can't see this yet. Maybe in the second phase, it will be a better orientation and a movement that will get me in line, that will develop the dispositions of the enemy, that will allow me to begin the movement and, and the deployment. And then in that final phase, I will realize See, in time and place and in the clearing picture, the phasing is really in the mind of the commander and how he sees the evolution toward his intent. It is not a daytime thing, a reporting thing, and that sort of stuff. Phasing becomes an attempt to synchronize, which is not good. You know, it, it stifles initiative. It pulls back on people that can go, that have momentum. Phasing is restrictive. Even if you say, just report at the phase line. The mental picture is we got to all be along the phase line. 
You know, and if you don't have communications, what does he do? So phasing is a dangerous thing. It's automatic. It's one of those things that were built in that we got to watch. It doesn't work. You have to create your organization a sense of mental and physical action. Anytime I see somebody heat up an MRE, I displace the CP. Because then I know we've been there too long. Anytime a guy breaks out a heat tap or he dicks with it, you know, he takes this MRE, this MRE, and he's going to combine them in accordance with the McElhaney little cookbook he has. It's time to move. You know, we've been there too long. We don't do that stuff. And the idea is this agility, the ability to react. Now, I want to follow up with something very, very important, a very important distinction. <coughs> Tempo is controlling the pace of battle. Decisions like whether to give battle or refuse battle, cause, you know, generate the action, cause reaction, get inside the OODA loop, you be the actor, he has to be the reactor. Dangerous little thing you got to watch here. Never confuse activity with tempo. Never confuse speed necessarily with tempo. Never confuse the fact that you do more things with you being more relevant on the battlefield. Vietnam's a classic example. The more active force was the US. We were more active, we did more things. It was useless activity that expended useless energy. It did not control the tempo. The guy decided what he wanted to fight. An analogy for you. You've all seen boxing matches where the little guy comes out all high speed geared to go and for the first five rounds throws 138 punches to the other guy's two and then the boom, he's on the deck, right? <laughs> he never controlled the tempo. He was more active with a lot of irrelevant activity. Irrelevant activity means doing things for the sake of doing things. We did that in Vietnam. Irrelevant activity means chasing irrelevant vulnerabilities and counting them. The little Gomer in Vietnam was easy to kill. He was easy to kill. We liked that he was easy to kill. Sometimes he wasn't even the bad guy. We just killed somebody. Hey, throw a grenade down, make him a bad guy, you know? And so we counted him. This was fun. You bag these little suckers like dove season with no restrictions, you know? <laughs> that was a vulnerability in that he was easy to kill. It was an irrelevant vulnerability, and we expended a lot of energy chasing that vulnerability. Get the bodies, shoot them. I was assigned to dig up graves, smelly graves with 80 bodies. Count them, you know, got two more to the head, yeah, he's one. You know, that's the way we had to go about the goddamn war, chasing an irrelevant vulnerability at an activity level that meant nothing. Those of us in Vietnam can tell you about endless sweeps that we conducted. Nobody was there except booby traps. We swept, we did it. At the end, you know, remember, you know, they talk about now good morning Vietnam all shit. The radio would come on, the guy would say, US Air destroyed 80 miles of trench line today. Oh shit, so what? You know, 80 miles of trench line. We destroyed an irrelevant activity. We felt like we were in control because we were doing that shit. And you got to watch that, because that's where your energy level goes down. Maneuver versus firepower. Why versus? Because we have created a mindset, gentlemen, that these two things are in competition. I know you didn't intend to do it, but as soon as you said these two, or the implication was made, or we drew the inference that these are competing, you made them fight each other. As soon as you made the implication that one was subordinate to the other, which is bullshit, firepower is nobody's handmade. I don't give a shit what you say. I like firepower. It kills. It's macho. It's steel on target. You know what's happening out there? I want to tell you. We're teaching our people to kill people with people when they don't have to. I say kill people with things, not people. The, the lieutenant, the captain, will move against an enemy when he could kill him. Read Rommel. Rommel says, as soon as you get hit, plaster the bastard with fire. First thing you do, plaster him with fire, you know? Fire and movement, maneuver and firepower are complementary. They're meant to be integrated. Don't get hung up. It's the same mind game like deciding on LD and LOD, trying to decide which one's subordinate to the other. There are times when you will kill with firepower. Maneuver will set it up. There are times when you will kill with maneuver and firepower will set it up. We had fire flushes in Vietnam. 
We laid in a series of ambushes. We blew the shit out of the mangrove trees, bust the little bad guys out, and then killed them there. Firepower pushed them into the maneuver elements, and we killed them that way. There were times when we let him in to a trap. I shot a 714 round TOT one time on a bunch of bad guys that got sucked in because they were they found the gap. No shit, he found the gap, Jack. <laughs> and it was 714 rounds on your ass, you know? Firepower did it, maneuver faked him out, let him into it. Gotta teach these lieutenants how to integrate. I was on a board today where we didn't think about this. Climb the hill and knock the guy off. Why? Smoke him and HE him and go around him. You know, again, read about the North Koreans during the first parts of the Korean War when they came down to the Busan perimeter. Well, look how they handled the Army. The Army popped themselves on every piece of high ground. They just flowed around him. Tank fire, artillery, and everything suppressed them, pinned them down, and they just flowed around him, flowed around him, all the way down. Low ground, valuable low ground. Recon versus security. Worst thing I can hear is security screen or recon screen. Recon does not screen. Screening is security. Security orients on the good guys. Reconnaissance and intelligence collection orients on the bad guys. I know people that say, I got my eyes and ears out because I'm surrounded by reconnaissance units, reconnaissance patrols, and sensor strings. Your eyes aren't out. You're secure, you're protected, you're in a hole. None of that shit's oriented on the enemy, it's all oriented on you. I know people that put sensor strings in on their flank, and then the two controls it. If I put a sensor string on my flank for security, that's a three's obligation to worry about that sensor string, not the twos. That's not, that's not intelligence collection, that's security. There's a difference, subtle, on what you're orienting on. If you're gonna go after the bad guy with your intelligence collection, you need to go after the bad guy. If you're going to use those assets for your own security, don't deceive yourself that it's collecting intelligence. It'll tell you when doomsday is coming, that's for sure. You've been penetrated and it's coming pretty fast, but don't confuse these two. I teach a class on all this shit and on how to saturate areas with intelligence collection assets. I get a lot of questions from lieutenants like, sir, if you have to clear, if you have to do a route reconnaissance, if you have to clear a road, how do you do it? If you have to go into an area, like a, a, a jungle area, something like that, you're not sure where the enemy is, how do you seek them out? What's your patterns? I teach checkerboarding, crisscrossing, cross frame patrolling, all those sorts of things that are means of taking an area, dissecting it, picking it up, and finding out what's in there. You know, and, and, and it's a whole set of techniques to, to be picked up, part of the battlefield skills. In the security part of this thing, you need to protect your own vulnerabilities your own centers of gravity, your own lines, your own resources. I want to talk a little bit about the reserve. We designate a reserve. I don't like the term reserve since we're into changing terms. Reserve is like in cooking. Reserve two egg yolks, you know, hold them back. The term reserve implies holding it back. I don't like it. I don't like the idea of big reserves. I think that's bullshit. That violates everything we've heard in two days. I rarely use a reserve. My reserves are deployed laterally. Not vertical. I want you to think about that. The guy thinks I got a reserve. Because you're a goddamn American, you have a reserve somewhere. I really don't, you little sucker. He's deployed laterally. So if I see four battalions, you really got five. No, I got four. You hit two, the other two will become the reserve. And they'll come at you laterally, not vertically. You know? Think about that for a while. I don't decide on the reserve. Now the missions for the reserve. I want you to take all the missions that we write about. They're all, they all reinforce failure. If you assign a reserve for rear area security, that reinforces failure. What failed? The rear area security. If you assign a reserve to be prepared to carry out the mission of one of your maneuver elements, what failed? That maneuver element accomplishing its mission. That's a failure mission. You know, you have to have an anticipated use of this reserve. You have to see it. I got a question for you. The reserve, the force of opportunity, so valuable, the key, the thing that drives it home. When it's committed, is it the main effort? Should it only be committed as part of the main effort? If you commit it to less, what's the point? Think about that. Every time the reserve is committed, should it be the main effort? Should it be part of the main effort? Should it be part of springing the main effort home? If not, you got to think about what the hell you're doing with that reserve and why you have it. Think about committing the reserve first. I don't buy this bullshit that he who commits the reserve last wins. I like first. I make my guys give me examples of when you commit the reserve first. They're pretty good. Spoiling attack. You know, in a defense attack. I just gave you an example when we were in, uh, in, in Germany, where we attacked. 
in, in the defense. You know, why? Uh, it, throw it in there. What about if it's an amphibious operation? You got to reserve helicopter corn. You're worried. There's a goddamn enemy reserve running around out there. I'd like to know where it is. I'd like to fix it. I'd like to pin it. If I knew where it was, I'd get it. Once we get ashore, we start moving. You find it too, I'm going to send the reserve right in and fix it. That's the center of gravity. I want to pin it. Well, he comes in the night before the landing and says, we found it. It's here. Commit the reserves tonight. Before H hour, L hour in the morning. I, I, I got a trigger finger on the reserve, I gotta admit. Now that flies in the face of everything I know you guys read about and know I'm a trigger finger with the reserve. It's uncharacteristic of Americans, and I'll tell you what, it screws people up. I also like to create imaginary maneuver elements. I, gener I, had, I had a fake maneuver element to force on force. Took some tanks and Amtraks, some engineers and shit, and created a pretend battalion. You know, and, and these things are these things are great running around because people try to count. See, they IPB it. You know, they count your maneuver elements. That's got to be a maneuver element. It's running around on its own. It's up here, and you can fake them out. I think we need to be a little bit more imaginative with this idea of the reserve and how it's used and where it's employed. And I don't think we we should think vertically about reserves. We need to think laterally. Risk. We talk a lot about risk. And we say we've got to take risk. But one thing we fail to, to talk about is how do you judge the degree of risk you're taking? That's something to teach the officers here at Quantico. This is risky. You know what my question is? How risky? Am I going to lose the whole enchilada? Or is there a danger that I, you know, I'm going to get my ass kicked and have to give up three clicks? What is the risk? We don't teach people to measure the degree of risk. Rommel, I read somewhere, measured the degree of risk. If I do this, I can lose the whole campaign. If I do that, I might lose the force. If I do this, I might lose the battle. You know, but measure the risk you're taking. You're more confident in taking the risk if you sort of have a little feel, a little instinct about exactly what you're risking in the worst case. Measuring risk is going to lead in determining the degree to a better acceptance. The last point, and you never thought we'd get there, I want to talk about, is something called battlefield adjustment. The mark of a truly great military force is the ability to adjust on the battlefield, to tactics that are now required that you didn't anticipate, to new techniques, to weapons. Examples. I read Iwo Jima. Go back to that. Right before Iwo Jima, after Tarawa and Peleliu, the Marines said our organization is screwed up. So right between, in between battles, they reorganized the Marine Rifle Platoon. Two squads as we know them now, with fire teams as we kind of know them now, except they were three-man instead of four-man, but they formed a fourth squad. This squad was composed of two demo teams, two flamethrowers, and two BARs. BARs covered and suppressed, flames went up, you know, burned everybody, pushed them back, and then they blew them up. The old blind and burn and blasting kind of concept. That was an innovation for the islands that had caves and bunkers and adjustment. Rommel with his 88s, a battlefield adjustment using the weapon system as it wasn't anticipated. The techniques, corkscrew tactics in the Battle of Okinawa. I love it. You know why I love this one? Because the tankers go crazy. You know, the tankers are, I wasn't, I want to be a maneuver element. They took one tank, one engineer squad, one infantry squad, formed it into a team, and the infantry corporal commanded the tank. I love it. Worst thing we ever did was get rid of the infantry foam on the tank. That's the worst thing we ever did. I'm telling you, tank infantry tactics are not dead. We parked our tanks in Vietnam. Read how the Australians used their tanks in Vietnam. I will recommend a book to all you in basic school. It's called In Good Company. It was written by an Australian who was a platoon commander in Vietnam. He's now a lieutenant colonel. It's the greatest book I've ever read about small unit tactics operations, small unit leadership, small unit leaders thinking. It's phenomenal. And he, they talk about how they use armor in the jungle, you know, and, 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 the, and the basic value of tank infantry tactics. We should can it. When I was a captain, we did it. You know, we cooperated with tanks. Now I can't. I get whisked along in the back of this APC, you know. And let me tell you how tankers do this. You made all these tankers maneuver element commanders, and they want to have it. They turn to the infantry guy and say, as soon as you dismount, you're on your own, Jack. You know, you got it. <laughs> I'm over here. You're there. You, know, it, it, you think there's cooperation? It's a 29 palms mentality. Yeah, we got to be careful with all that. There's a use of armor in the Philippines. I really saw it the time I was down there. 
But it isn't going to be with the kind of mentality we have now. Again, it's just I don't do Windows syndrome and, and the failure to adjust. You got to adjust to the environment and to the enemy, what he gives you and what he does. If you can't make the adjustment, you're doomed. There's going to be many more days on the Somme and the kind of civil war tactics we have. All right, I'm done. Three hours instead of two. If you got some questions, comments, I'd be glad to take it. <laughs> sir. Yes, sir. You, you said you did 10 operations. How many times did you identify the center of gravity before each operation? Or did, did you do it every operation? Every operation. My guys made me do it. And sometimes, I'm going to tell you something, I was stretching. There wasn't enough there to really come up with one that I was confident in. But I had to have one, because you have to have a focus. You have to have something you're aiming at. So it had to change then eventually, or it had to clear up and become more defined. But I had to have something to grasp onto. And I had to have one thing. My guys would try a lot of times say, there really isn't one here, Colonel. And I'd say, no, we're going to make one. We're going to make one. We're going to have a focus. And if it isn't right, it'll get us into the fight, and, and we'll clear it more, or we'll change it. Sometimes they said, sir, there's a lot of them. There's three of them out there. Let's go after all three. No, we're going after one. You know, we're going to focus on one. But we did. You know, and, and that led to a lot of interesting discussions. Not all the time was I confident. But a lot of times, these were pretty hokey. You know. Is that the things got started you know, the highest level of well, absolutely, because I don't think you can express intent without having an object for your intent. The object has to be the center of gravity and what you want to have happen to it. You don't like the term center of gravity. If we're going to create a new term, it's going to be critical capability, you know, whatever you want. I don't call it, again, you know, Buick, Chevy, whatever. It's there. You want it. It's a thing. It's something, it, you know, and I don't mean a physical thing, but there is something to latch this intent onto, to anchor it to. Or else, how can you have an intent without an objective? How can you have an objective without an idea of something you're after and you want to disrupt, dislodge, break the cohesion of, destroy, neutralize, suppress, or whatever? You know? As far as vulnerabilities, you didn't always, those weren't always obvious when you started. Right? No. You could attack without knowing specific vulnerabilities. That's right. That's right. And, and you're looking for the vulnerabilities and you're looking for the relevant ones. Again, you know, that's, that's something you got to sense relevant to the intent and, and, and of course gearing you eventually to the center of gravity. Can I ask one more question? Sure. Yeah. I'd like to ask you on three specific procedures we use in your, your comments on these and how you use them or if you did. Met TSNL, the staff planning sequence, and uh, the IPB you, you already talked about. All right. Let's take the first one. I'm a big believer in the estimate of the situation. I think if you master the estimate of the situation, you understand it, you truly can draw, you can truly do an analysis of the mission, you can truly understand the enemy, draw the center of gravity, look at the vulnerabilities, understand the value of terrain, the appreciation, use the environment, all those things. Imaginative, the, the, the true essence of the art of commandership, develop combat power, generate it, maximize mobility, all those things you do as a commander in the decision, those are the results of the proper estimate of the situation. The true quality of a commander is the ability to do the estimate. I don't give a shit if it's a squad leader. The kid that all of a sudden's on patrol and bam, bam, two shots, he's down, they execute a contact right, and he's now got to decide, do I break contact, do I go into him, do I call for fire, he's gone through an estimate. And you and met TSNL framing, all right? You may not like it because it's a gross resistance and acronym, but it's still, you find something better, fine. It'll still have the same components to it. It's automatic. Let's go through the staff planning process. The rapid planning process with the MUSOC, I fell in love with that. I got my own. It isn't the one they teach at the LFTCs because I don't like it. You know, I develop my own and I use it all the time, even in the conventional locks. Because it's fast, it's quick, it gets things done. It relies on a couple of key things. One is integration of staffs, not layered staffs. You know, when you go through it relies on quick, short briefs. It, re it, re it relies on, on, on quick decision points. You know, it's done very quickly and it shortcuts the system, but still manages to get in the critical things and, and, and reduces time tremendously. It's an efficient way to do business and it doesn't leave anything out. Let's talk about time, planning time, which is the true crux of the matter here. If I got 12 hours, why not use 12 hours? 
Why not milk my staff and my subordinate commanders for everything they got? Why not bring out every idea? Why not go through every fine detail I can to ensure the operation is going to be a success? Now, if I've got 12 minutes, then I'm just going to say, go. I want to tell you a story. We had a guy standing up here last night who said, the Royal Marines, you know, and the SAS and all this stuff. I had a company when I was in 1st Battalion, 8th Marines, we went to the Caribbean, and I was given to a Royal Marine commando, one of their battalions, for the, the deployment. And their, one of their companies came to 1A. Now, this is right after the Vietnam War. All my NCOs were Vietnam vets, you know. We were on this exercise, we landed in Vegas. I was on the HMS Bulwark. We had beer and rum, and this was great, troops loved it. We boomed ashore. In the middle of this exercise, the CO, the commando, calls me up and tells me, we're gonna have a little change of plan here. We want you, instead of doing this, to do that. Got it. Boom, moved out. Next thing I know, his little Wessex comes flying over me, drops in, stops me, comes down, he says, come aside here. He says, I've got a question for you. What are you doing? Hey, you told me to change the scheme, go from here to here, I'm gone, you know? Instead of being on a sweep, I'm gonna be on the block and moving down here. How can you do this so fast, he said. What do you mean I can do this so fast? I got the radio, told my guys, we're gonna do this, this, and that, boom, we're here. <laughs> no, you've gotta go to an orders group first, and we gotta have a glass of lime juice, you know? Which is what's easy. Hey. <laughs> A little more rum and beer I might consider. Fine, <laughs> you know? So, you know, I, I want to give you another sea story, because I think it's important. It goes back to SMEAC we discussed today. When I was a company commander in Vietnam, first came in, I gave an order to my platoon commanders. They went out and gave eh, an okay order. Squad leaders were out there. We were in a landing zone ready to be picked up. We had a lot of time. We were going to be there about an hour, and they had plenty of time to give the order. I went around, and I was listening to these orders. They were terrible. They were rambling, disjointed. I listened to a platoon commander give an order, and the guy saying, Sir, let's go back and talk about shallow and ammo again, how that's going to happen, and all this stuff. You know, he, I finally called the platoon commanders back in. I said, This is the rule. SMEAC, five paragraph order. You got the laminated cards, you're going to use them from now on. You got it? All the squad leaders are going to use them. Ah, sir, you know, shit. Use them. Well, now what I started to see is they broke out the card. They didn't write anything. They just went through it in a sequence. I saw a platoon guy waiting for admin and logistics, knew when he was going to get his little load. Nothing was left out, you know, pyro signals and everything. A good little procedure, quick, efficient, nothing left out, knowing my antennas need to go up. They framed it. It was good. It went. I made all my squad leaders do fire plan sketches when we stopped. Why? Because it forced them now to pay attention to what the hell was around them and out in front of them. First time I asked for fire plan sketches, one guy came back and he was an artist. He drew a picture. What was that? I mean, not, not a sketch, he read it. He drew this picture. I mean, it's beautiful. I got it framed. Photo of Vietnam, you know, doing whatever. Not, not a clue. These things, these techniques, a lot of them, we have to examine them carefully now, are valuable. They cause efficiency. If they cause a degradation of effectiveness, that's a problem. If they don't reflect reality, that's a problem. They need to be canned. If they are effective and efficient, we need the technique and the procedure, and you need to put it in. If you become you know, if you become a victim of that thing and it drives you and it becomes an end to itself, then that's wrong. That's a personality function. Remember the first thing I passed up here was the commander in common, the personality, the driver, the force. If he isn't that strong a personality and he becomes a victim and subordinates himself to a process or procedure, shame on him. Shit can, you know? We're Marines, or Rue God, we don't need that shit. <laughs> Now, your last one, I don't believe in it. I don't like, for the same reasons Bill talked about, I don't be like, uh, I don't believe in templating anything. I don't believe the bad guys are going to give me that. You know, I, I don't really get into that kind of templating. I mentioned doing it once because they were Americans and they were predicted. But uh, I would never trust anybody to template. I didn't let my tooth do that. We didn't template shit, you know. Anything else? Tom. Yeah, I want to ask you, you know, you like that term center of gravity, we had a big debate on that. And a lot of it comes because of the excess baggage associated with cause. So it caused me to raise the question to you, when you use center of gravity, what does it mean to you, other than saying it's the center of gravity? Well, in other words, obviously it's related to your opponent and what you're going to do. So what does it mean to you, as a commander, say we're going after that center of gravity? It, it is something that I can, that if I can, disrupt it, it will lead to his unraveling, 
his destruction, the breaking of his cohesion, his defeat. Okay, then in essence what you're saying, in that sense, and it represents some kind of a critical capability which unravels, is that correct? Yeah, by definition it would have to be critical or it wouldn't unravel and lead to his well, defeat. Point. Yeah, in a sense we're talking about a critical capability. Yeah. Am I right? I'm, if I'm saying it wrong, it's it way. might not be a capability. It might, in fact, be a vulnerability. Right. Why not? And it will lead to his destruction and disruption. It's a vulnerability. It, it's a let, let me, let's take the Army of Northern Virginia, if you will, and let's, for the sake of argument, say that maybe their center of gravity was Richmond because they were tied at an umbilical cord that summer. Keep threatening Richmond, you're forced to suffer in front of you, and you can keep fighting and then apply attrition warfare because we're a less talented force and beat them. Now, you may argue with the analysis of that. My history may be all screwed up. But was that was Richmond a capability, or was it a vulnerability? But well, why get it? That's another head game, you know? It's not just a vulnerability. It's a critical vulnerability. Okay. Critical, critical I, don't, I don't have any problem with critical. Yeah, by definition, that's right. Yes, that's why I'm saying. Either a critical capability or a critical vulnerability or something that right. causes unraveling. Okay. Critical something. Who cares? Yeah. Who cares? Right. Exactly. And I think that's the key word. You've got to make sure that something critical is going to cause him enormous problems so you can realize his purpose and he cannot. That's right. You pull him apart. Yeah. Okay. And the reason why we've been through this, and we've had a huge debate on it for a long time, and one of the reasons why the way the cause was defined, it's all fucked up. Read it. It's all fucked up. The other point I wanted to, uh, I wanted to raise another point with you, unless somebody else has a question here. I mean, I don't want to raise too much of a question. Uh, you talked about boundaries, which, of course, I'm obviously very sympathetic to that kind of thing, because even when I was operating the Pentagon in the Air Force, you know, boundaries are horseshoes. So all I do is I agree with you, they're hindrances. And I like the comment that without boundaries, I think this is a key point you made, when you remove boundaries, you force this lateral cooperation so people have to work together. When you put boundaries in, it acts as a hindrance to work. The, the, yeah, and the lateral, the lateral cooperation may lead them to saying, sir, we absolutely need the boundaries. And, and, and I would not, I would give it to them then. Yeah, I understand. But you see, by me not imposing it initially, it leads them to the cooperation, which may lead to it, and it can be justified. But see, I think that's, that's the key issue, that the fact that without the boundaries, you force a cooperation that otherwise wouldn't be there. That's right. See, that's the issue behind it. That's why I love it. It's a beautiful idea. And the other point you make about phase points and all that kind of stuff, that's another boundary or a hindrance and that kind of stuff. Now, you and I had discussed earlier about culminating points. Those culminating points also can be what I call self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Now, in some cases, like you came back to me, you came back to me very hard about fuel, you may only be able to go so far you should understand that. But in many cases, what people do, they also say, well, we're only going to be able to go so far independent of the fuel, and they come up with something about the troops being tired and all that stuff. You don't know that at that point. And in that case, you can't recognize that until it occurred, or in, in, in retrospect. You should at least try to know when it's about to happen. But to try to predict that ahead of time is very difficult. Yeah, let me, let me go back to this. Well, let me go back to these instincts and this sensing of things. You, there's an implication of what you say that this guy knows his own culminating point, or he's created, or it's imaginary, or it's self fulfilling. I'm talking about the commander knowing the culminating point of his subordinate units. I have a feel for it. Let me tell you a, a little story about the, the force on force exercise. I had a battalion that was in the fight for 48 straight hours. And I don't mean just in the fight, I mean in the thick of it. By their own choosing, chose to fight for 48 straight hours. At the end of 48 hours, I called the battalion commander in. I says, break contact, go to these coordinates. You're in an assembly area. You're in reserve. It wasn't really in reserve. And go to sleep, because I'm not going to use it. And he said to me, well, I don't want to do that. And I said, that's an order. You're going to do it. And then he turned to me and said, thank you. We needed that. <laughs> he said, yeah, he did. And he went off, and I, I, I put him down in the bags for, for 12 hours. I know the culminating point. And I know where it is, and I don't ever want him to reach it, even if he doesn't. And I, you know, and, and so I got to keep tuned to that subordinate unit. Remember, I said I bring my four with me to visit the battalions, not my three. And there's a reason for that. But my context of using culminating point is more in a sustainment, you know, than it is in a, in, in, a, in an operational or moral or a sense. In a little bit, it is, but more in a, in a sustainment. Mike, okay. Yeah, so somewhere I really want to raise here uh, before the, the evening's already on. 
every time I listen to your pitch, uh, it gets richer and uh, and it gets better and and I leave and and whenever I hear it, I, I feel good about the way things are going. And, and of course, uh, I, I watched uh, Ninth Marines uh, operate over on uh, Okinawa, and indeed, you know the, the stuff that uh, that uh, Tony's talking about was taking place and. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I talked to, the, to these lieutenants uh, nowhere close to their regimental commander. I, I mean, I lived with some of them in the field, and, and, and this, this drill that they were being put through on the, uh, the center of gravity was making them think like no lieutenants had thought. And, 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 and my point is, I, 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 I don't want me or, or anyone to get carried away with the euphoria because this isn't happening throughout the Corps. And, and you know, if that man from Mars that we've, that, that we've um, talked about would appear and, and be here tonight, he'd say, well, the Marine Corps is, is really ready and rearing to go. Uh, however, I, I went out on Colonel Blitz and I, I uh, and, and I've seen a lot of other regiments and battalions, and you know the lessons, of course, that you picked up. I because I've talked to you a lot. I know I would say most of them come right out of your experience in Vietnam. I mean, they really do, and and, and so do mine. I mean, I mean that's why I get so intense about these things is because these ideas come out of Vietnam. You know that the boundaries didn't work, and and this uh, uh, the, the, so much of what we've been taught didn't. Yet so much uh, is relevant. Well, well, well what, I'm, what, 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 what I'm asking, and maybe you've got an idea here. And, and I'm using. I don't want to ping too much on Colonel Blitz, except that that was the most recent exercise I went on. I talked to the Mass Commander, and, and he certainly understood. You know the kinds of things you're saying, and yet when you went down in the field, you saw business as usual. And, uh, and, and our task is to fix the thing. And, and, and I just would like to hear your ideas about where we can go from here, uh, uh, so that so that we have a, a Marine Corps that's thinking green, but that is willing to put aside the things that didn't work. Because this machine seems to go on, uh, no matter. Well, the helicopter flop operations, you know, we've talked about them, we've laughed about them in here, yet, yet I'm convinced unless we change our modus operandi somewhere, so they're going to be going on six months from now and a year from now, uh, regardless of all of the words you've said. And, you know, what's happening in Ninth Marines now? I know Mike Strickland, take him out of the picture. I, I don't want to talk personalities. I mean, Mike Strickland is a great guy. But, but the thing is, any one of us, uh, you, you know, can take over a, a regiment or a battalion and do wonderful things with it, and then we leave, and it, and it goes back and to, to what it was. And, and, and I really think that... It's an important question, and I'd like to ask your views on it. How can we get this stuff to spread? I, I think, I, let, me go, let me make one other point, because it leads into this, and it's an important one. I heard a lot of talk about unit cohesion. I don't agree with the, with the concept of unit cohesion as I see it. Somebody tells me, I need to have my battalion replace that with company squad together for five years, and that's unit cohesion, and we'll be great, we'll go on the battlefield, we'll do well. Two days after you're on a battlefield, you ain't got cohesion anymore. You know, what happens on the battlefield? What happens on the battlefield is you take casualties. They gotta be replaced. Now you can tell me, well, pull the unit out and replace it. You may not have that luxury. What happens during, what are the dynamics during battle? Guys fleet up battlefield commissions. The battalion commander was killed, Iwo Jima. 80% of the battalion commanders were medevac casualties. They didn't necessarily fleet up the XO, they may have taken the, the XO from this battalion because more experience moved them there. So there is a movement, there is a leadership change. During the fight, a new unit comes in, you may want to spread combat experience. We did that in World War II. You may be forced into a political decision to rotate every year in and out of Vietnam, which means you have a continuous flow in and out. As much as you hate it, you're forced to live with it. There is non-battle attrition that goes on. War, every war I've ever studied is this flow of manpower in and out. 
cohesion, true cohesion, is institutional cohesion and not unit cohesion. It'll, unit cohesion will happen if you have institutional cohesion. What does is, what is institutional cohesion mean? It means when the corporal checks in that has an MOS and is a rank or a grade and is assigned there for a particular billet, you have an institutional expectation that he is, has a certain capability. We don't have that now. You know the problem what you're saying now is? A battalion commander can take a battalion and do something fucked up. Because we don't know what he can do. We don't know that he's bought into it. We don't know his capability. We don't know that if he possesses the traits of, of strong intellect, determination, will, and can apply it, and understanding of all this, the knowledge. So there's no institutional delivery, institutional cohesion, institutional meeting of the expectation of the individual. The first thing you got to do is do that. Make the individual strong, build him up within the institution, live up to the expectation that's presented by his MOS, the grade that he wears, and the fact that manpower sends him to you to assume that assignment. If the institution can deliver on that, no one thing answers that. Not a PME process, you know, not an officer's school in Ninth Marines, not an application in the field in Fourth Marines or whatever. It is a whole institutional-wide ethic or culture that has to be developed and has to be everywhere and has to be demanded on the receiving end and the giving end. We at Quantico are at the giving end. The guys who write uh, orders on people are at the giving end. Out there in the fleet, they're on the receiving end. Expectations on both sides. Demanding of certain standards on both sides. You know, there are a lot of mechanical things you can do. Force on force exercises, institutionalizing some sort of PME process within the units that you people to take part in, forcing the hands of commanders to do certain things. But you can't buy into it piecemeal. You can't say Quantico's doing it, Ninth Marines is doing it, you know, Paris Island's doing it, but nobody else is doing it. Or so-and-so's doing it, so-and-so's doing it, and the other guys aren't. There's got to be an institutional acceptance, an institutional ethic that forces this to happen across the board. And the focus has to be on the individual. And he's got to live up to the things we give him, the titles. There's a measure that has to be there, a very measurable thing that has, to, that has to happen and be measured. We published a reading list. What exactly does that mean to me? All, everybody's going to read those books, right? Wrong. Some people are going to read those books, right? All those people that read the books will get something out of it, right? Wrong. Some people will get different degrees of things out of it, right? And what should they get out? What should they do with what they get out? How do they apply it? I mean, we push something out there, good start. But where is it? Where does that probe go? What is it probing for? Now, I don't know the answer. I mean, I can't create the vision. I mean, the vision's already created by the Commandant. I can't design the implementation. You know, I, it, it, it's, it's gotta come from every aspect, every function of the institution. You know, every organization within the institution has got to pervade the institution, and I'm not sure how you do that, how you generate that entry. You can be, obviously, an evangelist and run around and scream and yell from the platform and entertain and hope somebody buys into it, or they're anxious to get their box lunch in about a couple hours, you know? But, you know, I don't know if that's going to help. General, wait, is that it? Do you want to go to sleep? Go to sleep. I want to sit here. Well, come sit here, sit here, go, go sleep, go drink beer. Make this stuff, and we'll, all the questions are over, two guys are left. You're listening to All Marine Radio on the All Warrior Radio Network.